Big Gab, episode 396 for Monday, September 18th, 2023. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm pretty sure I'm still in Durham, New Hampshire. Sometimes I don't know. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in spectacular Santa Cruz, California, it's Paul Kent. We're having more rain here. Are you not having rain, Paul? This time of year on the Northern California coast is the best time of year. Hmm. This is when it's, and actually, this is the time... For San Francisco as well, but this is the yeah. time where, you know, the tourists are gone, you know, the weather is fantastic, the crowds are thinned out, and it's really wonderful to be up here. I mean, actually, probably all of the, all of the, from the central coast to the northern California coast, this is probably the best time of year, you know, just the patterns of weather and everything yeah. like that. I, I would Whereas actually. The middle, middle of summer is awful. Sure. I would normally say that the the this time of year and into like September, October is certainly my favorite time of year here in New England, but we've just had so much rain this summer. And then the, the, that, that hurricane kind of passed us by. And I think the, the torrential downpours that we're getting today are kind of the side effect of that. So not a hurricane, at least not here. So that's good. But, you know, it's just like, man, more freaking rain. <laughs> that seems to be all I talk about on this show. Yeah, Gig Gab, music and weather on WMGG. <laughs> Sorry, WGGG. I don't know. Whatever. That's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Hey, I um I have a I have something to I have an experiment. So we talk about set lists on this show, right? Yeah. You know, the the like cover band set list. I have a set list to read you, and I just want your opinion of it. Uh and then I'll tell you why I read it to you, but first we'll just dissect it as a set list. So, uh, I'm, let's see. And, and if you don't know a song, it it's, it's fine. Like, we'll just, we'll just kind of skip over it. So, uh, Le Freak, uh, I'm coming out upside down, like Le Freak, the chic song. I'm coming out. Diana mm -hmm. Ross upside down. Also mm -hmm. Diana Ross, uh, sister sledges. We are family. He's the greatest mm -hmm. dancer. Uh, two songs by Madonna, Like a Virgin and Material Girl. Two songs by David Bowie, Modern Love, and Let's Dance. Uh, Beyonce's Cuff It. Daft Punk's Get Lucky. And uh, Good Times. It was Good Times Chic? It's sh good Times is Chic. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah fun. Right? Great set list. Yeah. Uh, it, like, party all night long. So... I saw this set list performed. Um, we went to see Duran Duran uh, uh, last week or whatever it was recently. And uh, it was Duran Duran before them was Bastille who I've seen before and has never impressed me as a live band. And then the, the, the band that opened up the show was Nile Rogers with, with his band and they played this set list. And of course, Every one of the songs that I mentioned that they played, he either wrote or co-wrote, which is, you know, why Nile Rodgers is, is the man because, yep. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, it was party. Like they started, it was a seven o'clock ticket time. They started at six fifty five. The venue was maybe 10% full. Like Lisa and I had just gotten in there. I knew that I wanted to see this set. Like, you know, it was like, make, let's make sure this might be the best part of the night. And arguably it was. Duran Duran was, was good. Um, I was surprised they put Niall Rogers first and, and not Bastille first. Although, if I were Duran Duran or any other band, I would not want to follow the Niall Rogers and Chic show because it's just a hit fest and a dance party. So it started 10% full, the venue. By the time they were four songs in, the venue was maybe 50% full and everybody was on their feet. And by the end of it, the venue was a hundred percent full and everybody was still on their feet. And, uh, I would not want to be the band that followed them and, uh, uh -huh. at all. In fact, ba Bastille, the singer, one of the singers from Bastille said, said something to that effect. Like, Oh no, no, it's not intimidating at all. to have to go on after that. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was, it was fantastic. It really was 
was like, okay, yeah, this is, this is, not only is this the set of songs that you want for a dance party, but that's the band I want to see play it. Like, so um, how big was Nile Rogers band? Um, two keys, bass, drums, two guitars, Nile played guitar. And then he had another guitar player and two female singers Yeah, that, that took most of the leads uh, of the songs, the, uh, sure. the two Bowie songs, the, the drummer sang one of them. And one of the keyboard players, uh, sang modern love. He, and I think they both did a great job, but, but the guy who sang modern love was like, Holy crap. Like this guy can sing. Like it was That's great. Cool. Yeah. And then, and then the women that sang, you know, like I'm coming out and upside down and we are family and like a virgin and material girl, uh, they were and cuff it. Like they were, uh, spectacular singers. I mean, yeah. which which you would expect. It was, like, a, Nile it Rogers, was a pro show. It was a pro show. What Nile Rogers didn't just pick up, you know, randos off the street. I, he hired the right people. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, it really was. It was um, it was a it was a fun little set. So I think the tour so, is mostly over. So if you missed it, yeah. sorry, but no, it, it did come out through here. They did, yeah. the, I think, the independent out in San Francisco. So I went to a live show, which I don't get to too many, you know, like real shows anymore. Yeah, but I went. And saw Dashboard Confessional and the Counting Crows huh. at oh yeah at the at the the Berkeley the Greek Theater on campus of UC Berkeley which is I, that looks like ultimate. a great venue yeah it's fantastic yeah. yeah just the vibe is great the sound is great and the sound was freaking great and I'm reminded the Counting Crows are my jam everything about that that would be if you can draw, draw a dotted line from. Tom Petty's The Heartbreakers, the band, yep. to the County Crows, like a great piano player, you know, like like different sounding, crunchy, chimey guitars, yeah. and that type of thing. It was, and so that that is my, and they have so many great songs. I mean, and and Duris was in a great voice and was in a super performer. Uh, I didn't know much about Dashboard Confessional. It was a little after my time, but my daughter, who I went with, she was really into it, and. Uh, they were super too. I mean, just super powerful. Huh. Lead singer has really high range and, you know, just delivered. They had a woman, you know, doing a lot of higher harmonies on top of his high range. But sure. man, the Counting Crows was just a beautiful show. They're so, they're so unafraid to play slower tempo songs to start the show. Or even once the, you know, the, the vibe starts to rev up a little bit to bring it back down a little bit and play, you know, some beautiful piano based song. And then, of course, they, you know, they rock out at the end of the show with some, you know, really high ends. But Mr. Jones and Rain King are, you know, just they just pop up in the middle of a set somewhere and take the take the energy of the set list right where they want it to take it to. And then, you know, I think that they just really are enamored with more kind of theatrical music. And so then they'll go do some of the other you know, types of stuff. But man, I love that band so much. Yeah, I remember I saw that band open for the Stones, mm -hmm. like on the Voodoo Lounge tour. Uh, you know, so a hundred years ago, kind of, I mean, you know, people saw the stones 200 years ago, if that, if that's a hundred, <laughs> but uh, and you get to see him this year also. And you might get to see him again. I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, they opened for the stones. It was at you know, giant stadium or something like that, uh, just outside of New York or whatever. And um, I, I remember being impressed. Like they, they were, one of the better opening acts that I've seen the stones have, like it fit that vibe. Yeah. And I didn't know why it fit that vibe because it, it's like, well, here's some nineties band. Like, why does this work here? And you hit the nail on the head. They are, they're a garage band, right? Like, like, like the heartbreakers. And I don't say that in, in a negative sense, but they just play their, rip it, rip it. what's that? Grip it and rip it. They Grip it and rip it. And play. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They just grab their instruments and play. I exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I, I remember, um, you know, I think the next time I saw the Stones, it was like Kanye West or something open, and it was like, this is a really bizarre pair. Like, yeah. that pairing didn't, didn't work. It looked bizarre on the ticket stub, and it was just as bizarre in person. That the Counting Crows, the pairing worked. It was like, yeah, I can see this working for the, cool. you know, for the Stones. Yeah, grip it and rip it. That's that's what the Counting Crows are. Yeah, yeah. they're super though. I mean, again, they 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 are grip it and rip it in that, you know, the the instrumentation is pretty much what you hear. You know, right. whether it's a right, yeah, accordion, exactly. but yeah. it's just you know beautiful guitar tones coming out of you know beautiful tube amps and 
and the drummer just pounded away and mostly mostly p- acoustic piano like there's not any synthesizer sounds to any of their songs some organ but a lot of piano some mandolin you know one guy on a mandolin one guy on acoustic guitar one guy on a real chimey electric guitar and the sound is huge and the songs just have beautiful melodies and they're really fun and it's funny because they're like a, as a 90s band i don't know would you call 90s stuff classic rock now i think you would i was i i was I thinking about this the other day it, you know, we we had a conversation a number of years ago where we were musing on whether or not any songs from like the 90s or, or even the 2000s, like which songs, I don't want to say any, but which songs from the 90s or 2000s would sort of make it into the classic rock canon or or the, the just the 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 group of songs that become timeless. Right. It, it, you know, in, in some sense. And I don't know if the Counting Crows will be in that group, but they might be like Mr. Jones might be one of those songs that just sort of sticks around forever. But I also think the Bare Naked Ladies are have several tunes that will that will stand the test of time, I think, too. I could be wrong about that. But. Well, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting. I, I, yeah, we just we don't played, know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we just played our, our kind of summer closing weekend, three big dates. One was a was a Santa Cruz County Fair. One was the Santa Clara Art and Wine Festival, and one was the Los Gatos Art and Wine Festival. Um, and you know, the, September is kind of festival month out here. Okay. And um, and all three were, you know, very very well attended. You know, anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand people. And it is still that thing where if you're paying attention, you know, we play. You know, I can't help myself in the Motown, and you you can can see. It hits every generation yep. with joy, you know, and, and the thing is what music really does, what music really of the last 30 years does that as much. I don't know. I, and, you know, the, and the thing about writing music that lasts forever. So, you know, just take Mr. Jones. Well, Mr. Jones, someone who was born today in 20 years makes sense. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Right. right. I don't know either, but I'm saying, you know, I have a little data that says Motown, Makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it Michael does. Jackson makes sense. Yep. You do, Nile Rogers <laughs> makes makes sense. sense. Yeah, right? it, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just get it. You get the groove. You get the you get the communal spirit of everybody getting into the moment. And I don't know. I don't know why that. I mean, there's probably a lot of reasons why that is not the. You know the the writing style anymore. You know. You, you can muse on that in a lot of different ways, sure. about formulas yeah, yeah. and, you know, production and all this stuff. But, but like I said, we played three pretty big multi-generational shows and you find Nile Rogers like songs that turn the light bulb on for everybody. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's, it was fascinating watching this happen. It was like, Oh wow. You know? Okay. Yep. And, and everybody, Nile Rogers, he's an interesting cat because he is not he is not falsely humble, I think is the right way to say that. Because he he acknowledges that, yeah, look at like, you know, I, I write number one hits. Like, you know, that's like just the reality of it. And or co-writes, you know, what one or the other, you know, when he starts to put his stamp on it, there's a decent chance. That it's going to be top 10 of whatever, you know, target it's aimed at. But he also is like, but, you know, let's play the songs. Let's celebrate this music. You know, like it's, yes, he wrote them and he is unapologetic about that. But it it's also, he understands that these songs aren't his anymore. They You know, they belong to the collective consciousness, right? And so it's just going to be how it is. And, and we're going to, we're going to enjoy playing along and singing along with, uh, you know, I'm coming out or, or material girl, or, or we are family. And like, that's what these songs are is they, sure. they're everyone's songs in that sense. You know, everybody has a, a, a memory or, or something. It was like, Oh, they played this at my wedding or whatever, you know? And it's like, Oh yeah, it's not, you don't think about Nile Rogers. And I guarantee you most of the people walking into that venue probably had no idea that all these songs were written by or at least co-written by that one guy. And there he is standing on stage, 70 years old, rocking out, <laughs> you know, doing his thing. So, yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. 
I, uh, man, it, life's been crazy. I, um, I am in the midst of rehearsing for, uh, a theater show called, uh, called passing strange. And we are in the middle of tech week. I don't know what maniac decided we should record a gig gab episode after the second day of tech week for this. Uh, you Dave. Oh, was it me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a huge mistake on my part. Um, because I'm, if, if I know, if it sounds like I'm a little flustered, it's because my brain is mush. Um, te- theater shows are interesting in general, and it's been a while since I've done a, a proper tech week for like a show that I don't know already. Y- y- you know, this is a new show that we're trying to figure out and stand it up. And uh, we played it last night. So Sunday night, we played it tonight with like, last night was just what they call a sits probe, which is what you and I would call band rehearsal. It has all the singers and all the band members. And we just like stand in a, a circle and play the music like you would at rehearsal. Tonight, we we did it like performed with costumes and lights and, you know, lines and the whole shoot and match just to start to get a flow. We will do that again Tuesday night and Wednesday night, and then we will do it again on Thursday, except there will be people who paid for tickets sitting in the seats. Uh, mm. and, and then that will happen on Friday and I think twice on Saturday. And then, and then this opening weekend is over and, and I don't play it for like two weeks or something because of the way the schedule works, which is great. Like I don't, I can't do a theater show where I'm playing like six shows a weekend for six weeks or whatever. Oh, uh, it's done. There's no world. Not for me. But uh, so we're in the midst of this and it's really interesting because the way this show is the story of, I, I presume it's a fictional story, although there might be elements of, of, you know, real life thrown in, but uh, it is the story of a, the lead singer of this rock band, a black guy, that is the lead singer of, of this rock band. And it starts out like a gig. And then he, as he starts telling his story, other actors come on stage and start acting out his story, including a, like a young version of himself and all this. And it's, it's a fantastic story. I do not like musicals. And several people uh, told me when, when they you know heard that I had the opportunity to do it, they were like, do this. Um, mm. You're going to love this. My friend Julius uh, told me that. Uh, Billy, who was on the, the show with us here, he was like, wait, you're doing Passing Strange? Oh, yeah, could do that. I was like, wow, really? Okay, sure. Um, and, and they were both right. Like, it's a great show. It's, it's weird the way all the books are written, though. The person who is the conductor for our run, which is the keyboard one player, which is traditionally who would be the conductor, has almost no conductor notes in the music that they are reading and it has been a bit of an interesting thing because I'm used to the conductor being the one person that knows everything that's going to happen and can confidently sort of lead the band and the cast through the, the show. I think when it was on Broadway, first of all, it was performed by the people who wrote it. So uh, the lead singer was this guy named Stu and the bass player uh, was his partner, Heidi, and they wrote the whole thing and then pulled a band together and, and performed it. So, so there was that. But also, uh, we think based on the way the books are written that the drummer on Broadway was actually the conductor because my book is awesome. It has more mm-hmm. notes in it than I've ever seen in my life, and I always want this for now and forever. It's one of the best books I've ever seen. Because it's just so complete. I have cues for everything, but I'm the only one. And we're, we're discovering that through this rehearsal process. And so it's a little weird not having someone that like you, because the, like the conductor has spent the last three weeks with the cast working the songs and doing all this. So he knows how all that pieces together, but he doesn't know how every bit of the show links to every other bit necessarily. And, you know, we open in three days. So it, it's been a little, it's been a little weird. Um, yeah, it's been a little weird, but I, we'll get there. I, like the magic of theater, usually, at least in my experience, works. Like Wednesday night, it'll be like, I don't know if this is going to work. And then Thursday, it'll be like, oh, yay, it works. Bay, it's awesome. You know, whatever. <laughs> uh, that's, um, you know, knock, 
knock on wood. So, but yeah, it's, it's been, it's weird not having anyone on stage that is confident about how it's supposed to go. Even if we're doing it wrong, there's just a lot of, well, I think it's going to be this, or I think it's going to be that. And then we stop and there's big discussion. It's like, this is kind of a cluster, but it's, it's yeah. like, no, it's no one's fault in a sense, except it doesn't matter that it's no one's fault. Like it has to be solved. So, <laughs> um, it's, how will it get solved? How will it get solved? Well, we'll run it. Yeah. We'll run it two more times. And I, I like tonight I had to, it's, this is not going to come as a surprise to you. I, I sometimes step out of my, my role as you? Dave Bank. Come on. I know. I know. Uh... <laughs> so I had to control freak it up a little bit today um, because they were having an argument about what was supposed to happen. And I'm, I'm assuming that they are seeing the same thing I am as this, as this discussion that turns into, you know, not an argument, but you know, it's like, I no, I think it's this, I think it's that. And I'm looking at my music and I'm like, well, it's, it's, it's just spelled out right here. It's like, it's super obvious. And then it dawns on me. Oh, they can't see what I see. So I grab my music and I walk halfway across the stage and I start like explaining this. And everybody's like, wait, 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 there's too many voices talking. And it's like, yep. Okay. So I just put my iPad down in front of the conductor and backed away and let them keep arguing. And finally he's like, wait, 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 I have it all. It's right in front of me. Dave just brought it over. It's like, yep, that's what I was trying to say. Like I have the Me. answers. I have the answers. Just I know it's weird that some random musician steps up and starts getting involved in these conversations, but I'm not an idiot. I know what you need and I have it. So please take it. Like, let's get through this because I got to go record a podcast when this is over. So and it'll be fine. Hopefully I don't have to do that tomorrow night. The band is spread. The band's on stage, but we are nowhere near each other. So there's no like opportunities to like whisper between songs. It's, uh, it's all just eye contact and, oh. and not even then sometimes. Yeah. And it, like that, it reminded me of when I was like a teenager and was in the, the, the like the first band that I was in that started like doing well, this band called go figure. And you know, we were playing dive bars and backyard parties and like all of those things. In fact, we were playing like backyard parties for a while. And then finally we got a gig at a dive bar and that was amazing. But we were, you know, on top of each other instruments. It was, you know, cacophonous sound. You could barely hear anything. People were like stepping on my drum stands because we were, you know, a five piece band on a stage that could hold like a drum set. It was like a mm -hmm. drum riser, you know, whatever. And then we played our first, gig that like was on a big stage it was this place called the levitt pavilion in westport connecticut and outdoor thing they did this huge summer concert series and we were picked to headline a night and it was awesome and so we went and we set up all our gear and we took up the whole stage and as we're setting up the sound engineer this guy cotter who i learned a ton from over the years uh i credit him with a lot of my sort of foundational knowledge about sound it was my first time working with him. And he said, you know, what do you want in your monitor? I'm like, just vocals, whatever. He said, you want kick drum? I'm like, no, my kick drum's right there, man. Like, I don't know. I don't need kick drum on my monitor. He's like, you want guitars? I'm like, no, no, no. I'll hear those are way too loud. And we played our first song in sound check. And it was like, how come all, all I can hear is my snare drum and vocals. <laughs> it's like, this is a disaster. The guitar amps 15 feet over there. That's crazy. <laughs> and this kinds of, kind of reminds me of that where it's like, there's that, disconnectedness that you need to learn as a band, not just as a, an individual player, but as a band, you need to learn how to play spread out. If you've learned how to play like on top of each other, you know, and, um, and, and that night I remember at the Levitt, it was like, all right, let's split the difference. We can't have everybody, you know, edge to edge on the stage. Like let's, let's cut, you know, 15 feet off the stage, everybody yeah. comes in a little bit, let's tighten it up. Let's play like what we're, we're like, we know how to play and we'll be a better band for it. Uh, you don't have to take up the whole stage. So maybe that's the, the gig gab lesson. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Hey, I got something for you. Yeah, man. Two things, two terms that are thrown about that I think sometimes create a little consternation. If you're a cover band and you have, you play, many of us do, you know, quite a lot through the summer. Yep. And you play mostly within, let's pick a number, 50-mile radius. Would you sure. call that a tour? 
Oh, you could. Would you? I mean, you could. We we've done that with like with Bitter Pill before. They're like, you know, we joke about, oh yeah, it's our, our summer tour. I mean, you got a bunch of dates, you string them all together. It, it it's a tour. You could be, sure. I mean, right. people could argue that it's not. It, you know, you're not you're you're going home every night. You're not like getting on a bus and then doing the whole thing that that also falls into the definition of tour. Right, but uh, right. I mean, you you know, like you could have that argument, but it's a it's an argument to have. Sure, why not? All right, here's another one. Okay, you're playing a festival or any other multi band bill, and you have the last slot. Are you the headliner if it's not contractually described as the headliner? I mean, I I, I always think of the last slot as the headliner. Yes, but but. Sometimes at festivals, you will have, you know, the schedule for the day, the headliner will go on at whatever, 9 p.m. or something. And then there's the midnight set by a band that is not quite as popular as the headliner. Right. And that that's a different yeah. thing. But, yeah, I, I would say by and large, the, the band who's playing last, you know, w- with with those asterisks around it. Th- yes, th- th- I would say that's the headliner of the festival for that right. day well, anyway. Yeah. All right. Oh. I, I was actually thinking this. Oh, it's interesting that you say that. I was actually thinking you better be careful with that. So we we played a festival on Saturday, and there was a super fantastic band that played right before us. Absolutely awesome. The band was called Steel in Chicago. Oh. The music is Steely Dan in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. They were absolutely terrific and full of pretty well known local kind of legend type people. Right? Sure. I would not. We were the we were the closing slot. I would think it would be disrespectful to that very good band before us for us to beat our chest and say we're the headliner. Yeah. I I mean, the argument could be made that you are the headliner. However, then there's the political question of, do you want to make that claim? What is, what is that worth to you? What does it cost you to make that claim? Right? Like, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it, if you don't feel like you want to be identified as the headliner for a gig then, and no one else is going out of their way identifying you that way, then you don't have to. I, I actually lean more towards it's in the definition of your relationship with the booking people. I mean, if they look at it as just a multi-band day of stuff and they don't identify something as a headliner and they don't promote it as a headliner. Yeah. If you promote yourself as the headliner, you're a little out of, you're a little out of whack. No. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, you know, I'm reminded of that, that fling gig that happened out in Boston recently where the actual headliner asked to go on before us. And which, which absolutely. We me. did, we did this one. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to call us the headliner and I'm going to do it tongue in cheek so that everyone who needs to know that it's tongue in cheek can obviously tell that it's tongue in cheek, but I'm still going to lean into it and make it a little uncomfortable because y'all should have played last, you, you know, like th- th- there was that, but, um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you have to be aware of how it's going to land. Yes. Right. And, and that's, so, that's fair. Yeah, I I think you gotta yeah you gotta you gotta know yeah you gotta know what you're doing so yeah 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 I'm all for self promotion but right if you know it's up to you if you want to make enemies right you you right you you gotta yes exactly the politics of it are are something that is absolutely worth considering a hundred percent of the time yeah. yeah good answer smart I noticed something when we were setting up yesterday Paul for for passing strange so we got there at. Like we we were told we could get on stage at five thirty because there was like cleanup. There's like blood or something in the show that's happening in the afternoon yesterday, and so they have to like clean the stage. And so I needed to get my drums in for the show and like get everything set up for the run. And uh, so I got there. They said five thirty. I got there at like I don't know ten of five so that I could load everything in and just have it staged ready to like drop onto the stage. And they cleaned up way faster than they thought. And so by like five forty. I was fully set up on stage as was pretty much every other musician. And for some reason, uh, and I know the reason because there's a, there's a, a, uh, a theory that I'm going to propose here that I believe may stand the test of time. Uh, for some reason we weren't ready 
sound wise to uh, to start performing until almost two hours later. Now, the instruments were set up. The PA lives in the building, like it's already there, so n- no concerns there. And so all we needed to do was like you know get things mic'd up and off to the races, right? You're good to go. Now, you and I know that with our bands. We can arrive, I mean, I, I don't know about your band, you, I'm sure you do, but like with Bitter Pill or with Fling, if if we have a three o'clock downbeat, I would probably choose to show up at 1.30, but that's because I want 30 minutes of buffer time. I know that I if I could show up at two o'clock for a three o'clock downbeat and be absolutely ready to go, standing up a full PA, setting up everything, ready to rock, right? I believe the theory that I would like to propose here, Paul, is that set up will take as long as you have. It will Uh, take as much time as you give it. If you get there four hours before downbeat, setup will take you four hours. Or if if it's so funny. I right? Like Well, uh, it's that the principle the 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 working tech principles that work expands to fit the space that you give it. Exactly. Yes. This is not some new theory that I've come up with. It's just a a an implementation of a a long standing rule of life. Yes, work expands to fit the time, and that is doubly true about setup of a band. I, I don't know why. Like when I played in Ghetto Fabulous, which was a band kind of like yours, we, we didn't have as many horns. We had two horns, but you know th- that that kind of music or whatever. Our guitar player who managed the band was like, "Oh yeah, you know, we I I, I want to get there like three and a half, four hours before downbeat," and that setup took that long. But it was like, I, like I know how to set up a band and. Once a band like learns how to set itself up, it can really be efficient about it. And, and it generally gets efficient just by nature of repetition. And yet, you know, it took two hours because we had unlimited in a sense, we had unlimited time. Yeah. And then, and then at like nine 30, we were going to start the second act and, and they were, they had to ask everybody, you know, we had a te- we did have a 10 o'clock stop on the schedule last night. They're like, can everybody play an extra half hour tonight? You know, do you, do you have that? Is that okay? We just want to make make sure we get through everything. It's like, you know, if you said we had to, this be, didn't have to happen. This yeah. didn't have to happen. Like if you said five 30, you can get on the stage seven o'clock go. We'd have been out of there at nine 30, like no problem. And I, it's just it, but it, because there is, because that doesn't exist. And it's like, well, we need to give this as much time as it takes. It's like, no, no, set a hard time. If you realize we had a tech problem, we need an extra 20 minutes for setup, fine. Like things happen. We've all been there. But if if you have a hard, if you have a, I, deadlines are awesome motivators. That's all. Yeah. That, that's the, well, I, we used to be the worst at setup. Okay. And, oh, and yeah. we used to have to turn down a lot of gigs if there wasn't enough setup time. Mm. A large part of this was everybody going to in ears, but man, it was a huge yeah. quantum leap in simplifi- simplifying. Yep, you know, uh, uh, boards that that maintain scenes. That's a huge leap in in uh, simplifying. Yes, and now we can we're kind of ten piece span. Hardest thing is getting the drums on stage. Twenty minutes, and we can actually. I was just going to say, a- and that yes, the the drums should be the thing that take the longest. And like yeah. you said, twenty minutes. It is is what it takes to set up a, a set of drums for most people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We get the line check done. Guys are guys are you know tapping their mics and seeing if they're getting into the in ears while that? everything else is going on. And yeah, so you're right. I mean, it's a good skill. I, I and the funny thing is, in my band, the um, the horns don't want to be. They want to walk in and, and start playing. Like you know, like paid paid. Assassin guys, that's kind of the vibe they have. They don't sure. want to give up extra time, right? Yeah. So, you know, that that was that was one of the things that started pushing us, you know, rather than the grief of some guys like, well, why why do I have to be here longer than those guys here? Right? Getting everybody on the same page of this thing. Yeah. We kind of met we kind of met in the middle. And then these festival gigs just kind of pushed the issue to if you can do it in 20 minutes, you can do it in 20 minutes. And now pretty much, you know, Bill gets there about three hours before he likes to take his time and, you know, you know, get things set the way he wants band call is usually an hour before 
with a sound check a half hour before, depending upon like, a private event when date when doors open or something like that. That's di- yeah. When general, there's a private event, you, you got to do it all ahead of doors, even if downbeats two right. hours after doors or whatever. That's yeah, 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 weddings yeah. and that type of stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, you know where there's a will, there's a way, and I, you know I'm can attest to ten piece band. Everybody on in ears, we can do it in twenty minutes now. Yeah, man, absolutely. Not the sound system, but the band. Yeah, but you could do the sound system too. I like I there there I I've I've seen it done. I've done it. I've been part of it. It it is absolutely doable. You might add thirty minutes, maybe call it ninety minutes for a, a fairly substantial like portable with a rock band sound system. If you want to have more time because you like not to operate under pressure. There's no, like, there's no shame in that. I, if I have the time and I know we're doing sound and all that, I'll give sure. it extra time. Like that, that's fine. But if you had 90 minutes to set up everything soup to nuts, you know, get there and load it all onto the stage, set it up and go, you'd make it happen. Like I guarantee. Or, you. or in that extra time, you decide you're going to try something different and you're introducing risk into the system. Yes. Guaranteed something will go wrong oh, and yeah. you'll use every bit of that 90 minutes. And then and then you'll use it all. Right. No, this is like if you know what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's crazy. Um speaking of setting up drums, I have a gig with Bitter Pill on Sunday and my normal kit that I would use with Bitter Pill, my my Eames Birch kit, um was requested to be used for passing strange this show I'm doing at the theater because it's on a rack and it needs to move off the stage when the other show is happening. And and so it makes life a little easier. And so I was like, yeah, that's sure. That's fine. I've been looking for a new drum set, um, for a, a little while. I, I bought one just before COVID. It must've been like 2018, maybe 2019. I bought this Mapex kit that uh, I'm sure I've talked about here. I bought it used for 700 bucks, this uh, six piece, five piece, sorry, uh, Mapex kit, uh, four toms and a bass drum. It didn't, did not come with a snare. 700 bucks, it's a Mapex Saturn kit. It's maple and walnut. And I love the way it sounds. It's great. It's not exactly what I set out to buy when I got this kit. I wanted something that was good for uh, sort of, more more classic sounding like, like like lighter touch gigs kind of thing and this mapex kit with the walnut in the maple mixed together it really like it makes every drum sound uh, kind of one notch bigger than it actually is it has a deeper fundamental and i love it and i and i certainly could use it for any gig i mean i can tune things differently and that's fine but uh during COVID, I set that up here in my studio instead of my old like Ludwig Rocker twos that uh, would my go to kind of just rehearsal kit here in the studio. I figured with COVID, it was like, well, I'm not going to be taking any drums anywhere. I got two kits, so I might as well set up one of the uh, one of the good ones in the studio. So I set up that Mapex kit here, and now I don't want it to leave because it records really well, and I've got it all dialed in, and and so it is my at the moment anyway permanent rehearsal kit. But I still wanted this more classic sounding kit. I have a, a birch kit. That's my Eames kit. The, the birch drums have a really focused tone and a, and a real pitch. And I, I, I wanted something maple and warmer and kind of that, you know, more classic sound. And so I've been looking for months. I, I have some Craigslist searches that you get. You can like have Craigslist email you when like certain terms come up or whatever. So I've had these searches going since probably April and I haven't gone and looked at anything. There have been a couple that came across that are like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. But really all that did was start telling me what I think I wanted. There was nothing that was like, that's it, right? And then I knew I had this theater show where I was going to have a set of drums sort of dedicated to the theater. You know, I could take it out and bring it back in, but I don't want to do that. It's down these flights of stairs that are a pain in the neck. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. And I'm like, hey. it's like, I was saying to Lisa, I was like, I guess I'm going to keep looking on Craigslist and I'll find something. And she's like, why don't you go down and see Shane, the, the guy that owns uh, drum center of Portsmouth here in New Hampshire. So she's like, just go see Shane. He'll tell him what you want and he'll tell you what drum set to buy. Like, I'm like, Oh, and I read on the internet once, Paul, that if your wife tells you to go, to go buy drums, 
You go uh-huh. buy drums, right? Well, the internet never lies, right? And the, Why don't you talk to Don? Oh, yeah, I could. But Shane, Shane does, does me well. Shane, it, like, I, I am, I lead a charmed life in many ways. Having an, like, drum-focused, I think it's the biggest drum store in North America. It might be 20 minutes from my house is amazing. And uh, I've known Shane who started it just after I moved here to New Hampshire, uh, you know, whatever, 15 years ago or something. I've known him since he started it. And, uh, and he, he's a good guy. He's very well known amongst all the, you know, kind of musicians in the area. And so I sent him an email and I'm like, Hey, my wife told me to buy drums. So we need to talk. And I explained what I wanted. And he's like, oh, okay. And he asked me some questions and like, okay. He's like, all right, uh, you know, let's set a time for you to come in. Cause he doesn't usually spend a whole lot of time on the floor anymore. He's, you know, he's grown this huge business and, but he's yeah. like, yeah, yeah. You know, like if you set up a time with me, then I'll, I'll happily do it. He's like, cause I like doing this. And he knew exactly where to steer me. He's like, so it's probably going to be Ludwig or Gretsch. And I'm like, okay, that, that's fine. I'm open to anything, uh, you know? And I brought my daughter with me. Sky uh, played drums for a, a long time. It's been a while since she played, she's played, but you know, she has an ear and an eye for these things. And so she was home from Italy for a little bit. And uh, we went down to see Shane last week started playing different drums and playing different things. He's like, but I think you're going to like these Gretsch book Brooklyn drums. And, uh, I, we, you know, we tuned them up and played them and it was like, yeah, that's the kit I want. He's like, great, pick out a color. And it just so happened he had like overbought a ton of these whenever he bought them. Cause he had to, for his allotment with Gretsch. So he had, uh, several kits that were, he wanted to mark down, but you know, you can't do that except he called them used. And so this one was marked down quite a bit even though it was brand new in the boxes. And so, <laughs> so I wound up with a new, uh, it's a, it's a, it's the Brooklyn series. So it's maple and poplar, uh, but it's exactly the sound I wanted. And I love the way it looks. I haven't posted it online yet. I figure I'll, I'll go play it at the gig on, on Sunday and, uh, and maybe some pictures will come from that, but it's, um, it's kind of, it's multicolored. It's like blue and white and I'm, I'm, and I love the way it sounds. So, I'm stoked about it. I'm trying a new rack with it too, Paul. I uh, good health. What's that? Play in good health. I will. That's the idea. Yeah, man. I, um, I, I'm, I'm a fan of drum racks because let me, let me put it this way because you're a guitar player. Imagine if every gig you had to set up the action for your guitar in 20 minutes before you played. Right. Things are like the strings are not, you know, as high off the fretboard yeah. as you're used to. Like, like th- that is what can happen for most drummers. When you've got, you know, everything on different stands, you're kind of placing it sort of where you want it, but everything's different every time. And so I, for that reason and many others, I'm a big fan of drum racks. The other reasons are, uh, so the, 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 the main reason is it makes it, let you get much closer to a consistent setup because you can set the rack and, and put stands where you want them on it and all of that. And it makes like, it makes that part a lot easier. It also takes up, even though it looks like it takes up more room, it actually takes up a whole lot less room because you don't have like 18 triple brace stands all over the place on the floor, spreading out like a spider from the drum set. You just have like the feet of the rack and you're done. And so it takes up less room and, easier to transport and faster setup and faster teardown and all that stuff. But I, you know, they have racks have a look to them. And I, with this kit, I wanted it to look less like a modern kit with a rack. And so, um, I've seen for years, Gibraltar makes this thing called the stealth rack. Whereas most racks go like over the kick drum and, and are up higher. These racks are below things, and it's really kind of interesting. You kind of have one on the left side of the kick drum and one on the right side, and the one on the left side holds not just the toms, but the snare and the hi-hat. And those are the, the snare and the hi-hat are usually even with a kit that has a rack on just regular stands, and they kind of drive all over the place, and that won't be happening for me anymore. So mm. I'm really excited about, like, I, I mean, I haven't gigged with it yet, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. I, When's okay. the maiden wedge? What's that? Uh, Maiden Voyage should be Sunday with Bitter Pill. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, I'm stoked. So, yeah, you know, a little maple therapy. So, yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, what else do we have? Do we, uh, go ahead. 
I know that you posted that super funny but realistic <laughs> graphic about how about how rehearsal time is spent. I thought it would be fun to kind of dive into that a little bit. Yeah, in our Facebook group. So go to um, giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook and that will bring you to our Facebook group. Uh, it's open to everybody, of course. And there was, I, I saw it in some drummers group or whatever. And it's just a pie chart titled Time Spent at Band Rehearsal. And uh, it was various slices of the pie, all with different sizes. The the uh, The largest slice of the pie is arguing about the set list the the well the the smallest slice is pea breaks and uh and then there's the beer run depends on the number of bathrooms that there are at the rehearsal that's fair yeah because that can take a long time that's if there's just one bathroom that's right yeah um the beer run and and someone besides the drummer playing drums are are sort of all kind of in that that pea break size the uh the actual rehearsing i think takes up about 18 percent of this pie chart yeah. waiting for everyone to show up is a good chunk of it and then a uh a huge one that is a pet peeve of mine so, uh, unless the band decides that this is the process is uh listening to songs that were supposed to have been learned before rehearsal so I, I have so much to say, but we, we've actually talked about this in the past oh. many times. And you come back to your band develops a hive mind about this. Yes. And, and that hive mind is everybody in the band, after the first couple of rehearsals, gets a sense of what everybody else in the band will do to come to rehearsal. That's right. Maybe your band is contentious and calls people out. Most bands, I don't, I don't know most bands. I can't generalize, but, but you know, you know, you try and keep a productive working environment and and, and all this type of stuff. The, but I, I would say the biggest driver of, of of that whole thing is that is that after you kind of get to know the people who you're going to be playing with, you see what the work ethic of the band is. Some guys leave if, you know, some people, some guys like really, like, I know I want my rehearsal time to be efficient. And yeah. if this band doesn't have, right. Some, some guys, that's a, that's a, that's an end, end of story type thing. But, yep. but I think that the, the biggest takeaway I had when I saw that was that's, and I know my band is that way. I know in my band who is assuming other people are only going to put an X percent that they're only going to put an X percent. I know who's going to be, know everything and and i know that i can rely on that person if i fall down even if i don't know everything um yeah it's just it's all about the 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 hive mind that you create as as a group that communicates to each person what the amount of effort that'll be tolerated is and in some bands, it's a lot, and some bands a little. And again, the thing about that that graphic is, some bands do say, "Yeah, come, we'll learn the songs at the rehearsal." I mean, that that is a style, that is a thing. Yeah, Fling, the question when is Fling whether was, it's not a thing. You're right. right. It, when Fling was playing a bunch of covers, we found that our most efficient sort of combination vetting process and and learning process for a cover was. To for someone to literally suggest it often during band rehearsal, like, hey, I have this mm -hmm. idea about this song and we would listen to it once and maybe they would have have prep charts. In fact, that that would usually be a thing. Now, I mean, you can find charts on the Internet. It doesn't take a lot of time investment to to have that. Right. Sure. And so it would be we would listen to it, get a feel for it and then stumble through it. Like it was not at all expected to be perfect because we were literally learning it you know we weren't learning it we were playing it from the chart based on what we just heard that we played in the room but what that let us do was very efficiently see is there a reason for us to each go home and actually learn this song and come back and play it because we we learned enough of how we process songs to to sort of be objective enough for that first stumble through of like oh wait wait yeah, there's something to this that fits for the five of us, it, you know, or, oh my gosh, nope. Like this is a, yeah. this is dead in the water, kill it. 
And, and we could do that in 10 minutes. And so it really, even though 10 minutes times five is 50 minutes, it, it was actually the right way for us to spend that time, but it was an explicit choice that we made to do it that way. Uptown yeah. that the wedding band I play in is much more like what you just described the, the very adamant, like if a song is put on the list, the singer can veto it. Right. Because if it's like, well, I, I can't sing that. Okay, great. Then it's off the list. But other than that, you are expected to know it cold and come to rehearsal and play it so that you are rehearsing a song that everyone knows, not learning a song for the band. Uh, yeah. and, and it, and it's great. And to your, it, 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 but it exactly fits your point. Like the expectation is the bar is set very high. Like if you come in and you don't or know low. it, well, or low, but in that band, it's set very high. If you come yeah. in and stumble through it and you don't have, like sometimes it'll be like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize we were doing this one today. And this has happened to me. It's like, I, I didn't know. Like we just did eight songs. I, I knew that we had seven of them. Somehow I, I screwed it up. I, you know, didn't have that one on my prep list. So I'm yeah. going to, I'm going to stumble through this. And that, you know, as long as that doesn't happen every single time for every single song, it's accepted. Like, you know, it's, it's not like this is the military or something, but Otherwise, yeah, you're like it, the expectation is you come in and you play the song like you would at a gig. And there are many times in that band where it's like this. We are playing this song at the gig. Learn it because we, we won't even run it at the sound check. It's, it's going to happen in the middle of the set. That's the first yeah, time yeah, yeah. we play it together. Yeah. So, well, so, so three thoughts of this. One is I do have experience like when Mike Vanderhuel from Y&T sat in with us. Yeah. That. True pros learn, show up, ready to go. And that that is, of all the conversations we have, what is a pro? I, I would say there's one hallmark of a pro, right? Yeah. Preparation, right? Second thing is, some songs, even if you learn the part, like we were working on um, Keeping the Faith by Billy Joel. Do you know the song? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Anyway, we didn't have exactly that instrumentation and so what happened is the guesses that the guys made of what, what part that they, they would have to fill in for that difference, you know, everyone's individual assumptions, it didn't mesh very well. Yeah, yeah everybody made, made, made different choices. Made a guess yeah. on their own, right? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would be the other thing. And I would say, you know, the third thing is, if I have learned anything over the 396 episodes we've been doing this and, you know, seeing other efforts to talk about being life in a cover band life being a weekend warrior i i you got to be careful about painting everything with the same brush right like like if your band works coming over drinking beer you have a good time and you put out something that you know people really enjoy via con dios man That's right great. You know, if your band yeah. right if your band everybody's on the like, same nope, page yeah exactly as long as everybody right yeah i mean if your band is a bunch of pros whose time is extremely precious and that's one thing I learned from the horns in my band. I mean, they have their instrument in their hand 65, 70 hours a week. They're teaching all day long. They're, you know, they're leading marching bands in, in school, you know, whatever it might be, you know, it's not fun and games for them to come to rehearsal. It's not, you know, they, they, is, they may love me and they may love the band sure. and the hangout time may be good. They've had their horn in their hand or, or, or their drumsticks in their hand for eight hours in a day already by the time they show up for rehearsal, their time is extremely precious. It's not a novelty to be able to get together and rehearse. It's 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 valuable time. So I guess that's the thing is, you know, it, the common denominator, are most of the things we talk about here, is your band on the same page about what you expect? And if not, you know, you're probably gonna have a bumpy road about it. You, you may have a bumpy road. You know, it may not suit somebody. They go find something else to do. Yeah. It may, your bumpy road may still be the best thing in your town for them to do. And they'll just put up with it, but they'll grumble. I mean, who knows? But Painting everything with the same brush is is uh, is a fool's errand. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. We we share this stuff here, but it's not like we're not issuing edicts for your band. We we might talk about the edicts that exist in our various bands, but that, that's yeah. you know, the, like yeah, very good point. It, when I joined Fling, and this is this is like at the time that I joined Fling, I had young kids at home. Right, we had just moved to a new town. I was against rehearsing at all right i wanted to play gigs because i knew that for my sanity that was important right but 
I was not interested in spending all of my time in the rehearsal room. It's like, if we're just going to be a classic rock cover band, uh, which Fling was not, by the way, at that point in time. But my thought was, I want to get a, you know, find a band. And I did. I found that knockoff band. That that, that was the name of it, knockoff, with, uh, you know, it's a four-piece female-fronted classic rock band. We rehearsed exactly one time after everybody learned a bunch of tunes. And then other tunes we would just add in. And about a year later, after we had moved here, I wound up getting introduced to the Fling guys. And they weren't gigging at all. I was a new person in this area. I knew no one that like was lived in my town, you know? And so it was like, okay, I need bowling night. I need something like night out with the guys. And I don't mm-hmm. know, I don't know the guys yet. So I'd prefer to play music than bowl. Uh, so fling became once a week bowling night. And we just would, would go to Russ's house and just play. And there was no expectation mm-hmm. that it would ever go beyond that. Obviously it did, but you know, and people were like, wait, you're re- rehearsing. I'm like, ah, you don't understand. It's not, it's just getting together and like having a couple of beers and playing some, some great original songs. But you know, it was like, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's guy time. Like that's it. You know, it doesn't matter. We could be, like I said, at the bowling alley or, or fishing or what, whatever, you know, it's just, we're choosing to play music, but yeah. So we get it. Yeah. Yep. So your my your mileage may, may vary. What works for you works for you. So yeah, hopefully it hopefully your mileage does vary. Let us know. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We wanna like we wanna know how your band works and how does your band learn songs? Because we've shared the ways our bands learn learn songs. I wanna learn something from each of you and then we'll share it so we can all learn together. So feedback, giggabpodcast.com. You got more, Paul, or uh or is that the end for today? I think that's enough for today. I agree. I agree. Thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Fun. I love this. I love I, 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 it. It was crazy schedule wise for me to like literally drive home from rehearsal, run upstairs and record. But I'm glad we did. What's that thing we say, Paul? Well, we, we say always be performing, but take it easy on yourself, man. That's good advice.